Uh, when the search committee interviewed me eight years ago, you know, one of the questions we talked about was music, and they said, well, we don't know if we define our church as a singing church. So I said, we're going to work on that. We're going to work on that, right? We're going to work on that. And so every opportunity I can, I work on that. And this is no exception. So if you are able, please rise. If you are able. And if you'd like to volunteer and be with me, please come up. Because we all know Father Abraham, do we not? Abraham had many sons, many sons, and there are Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm. Father Abraham had many sons, all right. Father Singh and many Abraham, I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Uh, Father Abraham, and many sons. of you that have mixed emotions. <laughs> Some of you are probably saying, that was fun. Others of you are saying, I can't believe he did that. <laughs> and still others are saying, what was wrong with that search committee? <laughs> <laughs> but in my defense, I did it with a purpose. There's a purpose to it. There's a reason behind it. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't she do that well? There's a reason behind what I did. Because I wanted all of us to experience it the same way. And that is, when you sing, when you sing, singing should be a full body experience. It should be a full body experience. Even when you remain seated, singing requires your eyes, your mouth, your ears, your lungs, your diaphragm, and for even those who do their best to look down and sit still and occasional foot tapping. Right? That's why singing is not only good, but singing has always been one of the primary expressions of faith. Not just our faith, but any faith that's ever existed, any tradition, religious tradition that's ever occurred around the world has some act of singing, and praising. It is, as the athletes say, a full body experience. It's leaving everything on the field. It was St. Augustine who said, anyone who sings prays twice. I like that. Which may be why the Psalms are among the favorite passages most people have. And it may be why the Psalms are not merely poetry or proverbs, but they're loaded front to end with songs. Songs of hope, songs of recovery, songs of salvation, songs of sadness... 
songs of praise. Songs that speak to us on a level that is intangible and yet real. It was that great composer, Felix Mendelssohn, who once said, it's not that music is too vague for words. It is too precise. I love that. Which brings us back to why did I have us sing that goofy, silly Father Abraham song? Because that song unavoidably requires your whole being. Not just your voice, not just your head, not just your eyes or ears, but your hands and your feet, your whole body. And that bottom line is what most of us, regardless of age or status or gender, seek. Most of us seek in life something that we can fully give ourselves to, something that demands our all. Most of us seek in life something that moves us. We're resistant to it. I mean, we are. We do our best not to let anything move us. But deep down... Most of us want something that pulls and tugs and challenges and demands the best of us. And in the challenges and in the pushing and the tugging, it provides joy and fulfillment and peace. When you go to bed at night, which day makes you feel better? One where you have labored and done something and you go to bed exhausted from all of it, or the day you go to bed exhausted because you can't remember having gotten one thing done. We both know both kinds of exhaustion. Which one is the best? Another question. Have you ever driven down the road, say Gulf Boulevard out here, and watch somebody bebopping in their car, the windows are rolled up and they can hear the music, and maybe the bass is loud enough, you kind of feel it too. Have you ever done that? And you look over at them and they don't even care that you see their head bobbing up and down and they're doing all. They don't even care because, because they are so caught up in what they hear and what they feel and what they experience. They don't even care. They are possessed and committed to the purpose of the song they're singing. And I thought about that because that's really what faith is about being caught up in the purpose and the commitment and, and that whole body experience of uh, being about praise in your living that just is so full it has to be expressed. You can't hold it in. It has to be expressed. It demands our all. As Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with your mind, your body, in your soul. You love God with everything you got. You leave nothing behind. And then you have to express it. And how do you express that praise? How do you sing that song of joy in your living? It's the second part of that commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's the expression. There's the expression. And we don't care who sees us or thinks that we're silly or goofy in doing. Love God. Love neighbor. That's how we praise and sing that praise to others. You know, as I was writing this, I was thinking to myself that probably one of the main reasons people these days find life joyless is because they feel their lives lack purpose. They lack that purpose. You know... It's hard to get out of bed when you got no purpose, is it not? When you got nothing worth getting out of bed for, you'd just rather stay there. And as we get older, I think it's harder and harder to find this purpose. Why? Because we're y when we're young in life, we have all these outside sources that drive us. You know, you got to go to school, you got to get grades, you got to get a job, job demands you go to work, you get married, the, you demand things of each other in terms of the marriage, the management of the house, the apartment, the car, the kids, and then it all goes away. Kids, 
You've reached the peak perhaps in your career or you retire and then all of a sudden we have this empty nest, we have this midlife thing and the outside sources aren't dictating for us anymore and all we got left is us. And who is us? What are we about? Why am I here? What am I going to do with what I've become? And some people freak out, you know? We've all known people who do that. But, you know, there's a difference between freaking out and freaking out with a purpose of serving God. You know, what do I, what do, I do now that I have this time and I have this space and I have all these experiences God has given me? How do I sing God's praise in this new land, this different time and this new age? There are no distractions, no demands, and I have the choice of either redefining and reserving and recommitting or losing myself and falling apart. In reading and writing this week, I came up with kind of a phrase that made sense to me. It's, it, it goes like this. It said, living with purpose comes from living on purpose. Living with purpose comes from living on purpose. In other words, getting up every day and not letting life take control of you or others dictate who you will be or what you are going to do, but getting up with that purpose that says, today is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I am going to serve God in whatever ways God lays before me. I'm going to keep my eyes open and my hands as well. And I'm going to find ways to make this world better. I have a purpose. I have a purpose. And if you don't think that brings you joy or satisfaction at the end of the day, then do this. Go home and sit by yourself. Go home and sit in a corner, fold your hands, sit there, and tell me how much joy you have at the end of the day. If you don't believe that what I'm saying is relevant or has uh, any... Uh, uh, purpose to it, then keep everything you have and hoard it to yourself. All your resources, all your talent, hoard it to yourself and see what kind of satisfaction life brings you at the end of the day. If you don't believe what I'm saying, I dare you to get up, leave the sanctuary today. Don't look at anybody, don't talk to anybody, don't hug anybody, don't kiss anybody, don't say goodbye to anybody and see how good you feel walking out the door. You see what I'm saying? This is the day the Lord has made. I have purpose in it. And my purpose is not only to love God, but to express that love by loving others. In Genesis, we have two creation stories. <clears throat> Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Genesis 1 is the one we're familiar with in many respects. It's the seven-day creation. It says, it's all good. Genesis 2 is the one, the Adam and Eve story, and the rib, and the snake, and the apple, and the so forth. Okay, so we got those two. And I won't go into it why we know they were written by two different people with two different points. That's another story. But for my purposes today, it's interesting to me that when God gets to the seventh day in Genesis 1, what does God do? Rest. God rests. It doesn't say God was done. There's a difference between saying, and God was finished. God was done. It said God rested. Which leads me into Genesis 2, which is all about people. God rested. Okay, people, go from here. Go from here. It's yours. I gave you everything that's good. Share it use it and of course we know how that didn't work out so good but the challenge is still there the eighth day of creation is our day it is our day did you know that traditional baptismal founts this one is not traditional has four sides a traditional baptismal fount has eight sides to it did you know that it's an octagon has eight sides to us to remind us of the eighth day of creation our day the day we are born in Christ. 
God says, I gave you good stuff. You have a purpose. It's the eighth day. Use it well. You know, uh, you've probably heard it before, but it, it bears repeating that if you go to Israel, they have two seas, two major bodies of water. The northern part of Israel has the Sea of Galilee, where fresh water pours in in the Jordan River. It snows up on top of Mount Hermon. Snow comes down. Can you imagine the lowest spot in the earth? They ski. It's amazing. Fresh waters, beautiful, clear, crisp waters. They run into the Sea of Galilee, which that water is distributed then throughout the country to, to create all kinds of crops, from cotton to pineapples to you name it, they grow it. They get drinking water, they get all that. And then it flows from there down through the Jordan River into the southern part of Israel and Judea into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is beautiful. It doesn't sound very pretty, does it? It sounds dead. When you look at it, it's beautiful aqua. Beautiful, beautiful aqua. On the outside, it looks perfect. But inside, it is totally dead. Nothing lives in it because water comes in, nothing flows out. You see what I'm saying? One lake gives life because there's receiving and there's giving. There's purpose. There's sharing. There's a praise in creation that gives life. But the Dead Sea proves that when you only take it in and you never give it out, you can look real good on the outside and be just totally dead underneath. Which is what can happen to us. I think it can happen to us as we grow older. We grow older and life demands that we explore ourselves deeper. Why am I here? What do I live for? What is the song God calls me to sing in the twilight of my life as well as the youth? It's harder. But God always has music for us to sing and dance to. Scriptures say what? Make a joyful Make a joyful noise. Threshold's pretty low, isn't it? doesn't require you to sing on pitch. It says, make a joyful noise, which says, you can do it. Everybody here is capable of making a little noise, a joyful noise, to sing of God's love by expressing our love for others. You can do it. Despite what you may think, despite what others tell you, they can say you look goofy, like that teenager driving down the street in their car, windows up, speakers blurring. You can do it. You can sing. And in so doing, you don't just sing, friends. You discover what it truly means to live. To live. Excellent. You ready? Respond to me. Here we go. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be 